Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Brent. I'm the executive director of the Evo Institute, and it's a pleasure uh, on this solemn and difficult uh, day of commemoration to welcome all of you here um, at Evo. E Evo uh, has a commitment to remembering. We have a commitment to Jewish continuity. We have a commitment to education. And moreover, we have a commitment to uncovering new sources of knowledge um, about our complex, our amazing history of a thousand years in Eastern Europe and Russia. The Holocaust put an end to that history, though there are many groups in Ukraine, in Poland, in Russia, today in Lithuania, in Germany, uh, attempting to revive some shred of Jewish life in those countries. But for all intents and purposes, the center of Jewish life in Europe ceased to exist by 1941. But what did not cease to exist was the Jewish people. And one of the things that Evo is committed to ensuring is that the heroism of those who suffered through the Holocaust, those who fought in the ghettos, who fought in the, in the forests, who fought within the cities, who fought, as uh, Yehuda Bauer has very eloquently said, simply by standing in place, fighting through Amidah, fighting by retaining their dignity. That is a lesson that we have to teach ourselves and we have to teach our children because that is a lesson that we're going to have to draw upon again and again and again. It is the lesson of the Jewish people. This is a lesson that is not just one of victimization. It is a lesson of heroism. And we have to understand this heroic element in our lives. And so the story of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, as some of you, perhaps all of you, already know, is not that well known, not that well told. The reason largely is the uh, cessation of memory and the suppression of memory during the Soviet period, in which the word Holocaust could not be spoken in print or publicly throughout the length and breadth of the Soviet Union. And so in Baba Yar today, there is not a single monument that has the word Jew on it. You see young ladies with their children walking down the pathways of this beautiful park. You see men with their briefcases going to business meetings. You see kids playing with balloons. You see uh, uh, young athletes with their gear and they're walking upon the bones of perhaps 200,000 Jews who were slaughtered there without a single monument to that effect. And one of the things that Evo is committed to doing is, is filling that empty space of memory through our programs, through uh, broadcasting our programs now throughout Eastern Europe and Russia, in, in 2004, I published, while I was at Yale Press, the Encyclopedia of the Holocaust. A friend of mine in Russia then translated it into Russian, and he said to me, this is the first. This, this was translated three years later, and he told me, this is the first, the first reference book ever published in the Soviet Union with the word Holocaust on it. And so things are changing, changing slowly, but it's the efforts of communities like ours, organizations like ours, uh, continued uh, work 
uh, from the United States, from Israel, and from within those countries that is changing this picture. So today we have an excellent program that will include both a lecture and a film. Uh, but before uh, we begin, I would like uh, to light uh, the candles and invite uh, Mila Myers, please, to come up and do so. Dos Vigo, oi fabal com Gerroidet, Gerroidet, mãe ninguém é mãe nianco, is de estuban trun em mita flam fire, vi Jesus e roidet, mãe ninguém é mãe tires.
Now it's my pleasure to, um, to welcome Anna Sternschis, who is the Al and Malka Green Associate Professor of Yiddish in the German Department at the University of Toronto and Associate Director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University. Sternschis is the author of Soviet and Kosher, Jewish Popular Culture in the Soviet Union, from Indiana University Press, numerous articles as well. She is finishing a new book. She is an active, uh, highly accomplished, young scholar. She is leading the way, and it's a great pleasure to have you here, Anna. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Professor Brenner, for this generous introduction. It's great to be back at YIVO. My career actually started at YIVO 15 years ago when I got one of those junior fellowships as a graduate student still. And YIVO helped me in a way that uh, it doesn't usually help scholars, and that is that it was actually closed for the renovation. They were building this beautiful building. So I came here to work with the archival documents. And well, you know, the archive was closed. So um, I had to do something in New York, and what I did was that I went to Brooklyn and I started talking to people who lived, uh, uh, who were born in the Soviet Union, who were uh, Jews, and who told me about their experiences uh, uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And that fact, the give of closure, and the presence of those people in the 90s actually uh, changed uh, the way that I talk about Soviet Jewish history and provided quite a bit of uh, data material for me and for other scholars. So it's great to be back and to give back. And um, I wanted to start by saying that this beautiful record that we just heard was sang by Cantor Louis Dante. I met him a few times. He's also from Toronto. I guess Toronto is coming to talk about Holocaust in the Soviet Union uh, today, both uh, with Cantor uh, Dante and myself. And um, the beautiful rendition of Shalom Aleichem's uh, lullaby um, about Babi Yar. And um, Babi Yar is perhaps the most famous name or the most famous site associated with the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. Numerous memoirs, short stories, poems, and films, including the one that we'll see later today, uh, commemorate the tragedy uh, of Babi Yar and its victims. Babi Yar, uh, which literally means uh, women's ravine, uh, is a ravine in the Ukrainian uh, capital of Kiev and the site of a series of massacres which were carried out by Nazis during their campaigns in the Soviet Union. On September 29th to 30th, 1941, 33,771 Jews were killed on one single operation in Babi Yar. Uh, this is the, photo, the German photograph which documents the shooting. The decision to kill the Jews in Kiev was made by military governor, Major General Kurt Ebenhardt, the police commander for the army group south of SS, uh, Friedrich Jacqueline, and Enzides Group C commander Otto Rush. I'll talk about that in a second. It was after June 2, 1941, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, that the special forces of Einsatz Truppen uh, started to carry out what subsequently became known today as the final solution, that is the Nazis' large-scale campaign of racial annihilation. Eastern Europe, including the invaded part of the Soviet Union, um, was the area of the densest Jewish population in Europe. In some cities, in some towns, Jews constituted as many as 40% of the population. Now, what's unusual about the killings in the Soviet Union was not the fact that Jews were killed. After all, the war was going on for quite some time now. Uh, from 1939 to 1941, Jews were being killed in Poland. But what's unusual about the Soviet Union is that for the first time, the massive shootings of Jewish people happened near large towns, directly within the earshot, and in some 
cases within the sight or the smell of the majority of the population. Now, those of you who visited uh, Poland and seen Auschwitz and uh, other museums of, uh, of the site of the death camps there, they know that you know that they're located away from cities. Well, Babi Yar is essentially in Kiev. It's in a close by suburb, and Professor Brenner just mentioned to us how people walk by, and it is really within the city. Um, <laughs> border, and many other places, many other ravines where Jews were killed are look similarly centrally located. The corpses of Jews in Ukraine and other western areas of the Soviet Union were burned or speedily buried in shallow trenches or ravines. Immediately after, the Kiev, uh, after Kiev fell to Nazis in September 19, 1941, the Einsatz Gruppe C, which is a special, Einsatz Gruppe means special force, a euphemism kind of for a killing squad, started the work of identifying the Jews of Kiev. Five days after Kiev was taken, on September 24th and 25th, there was a number of explosions on Kiev's main street called Krishatnik where the headquarters of SS and Gestapo were located. Although these explosions have been planned by the Soviet secret police as part of resistance to the Nazi invasion, Nazis blamed these explosions on the Jews and used them, as we know now, as an excuse to start killing of the Kiev's local Jewish population. On September 29, 1941, just 10 days, after their arrival, the special forces and their Ukrainian helpers herded the Jewish citizens with their money, valuables, and other baggage to Babi Yar. Then the shootings began. When it was finished, there were almost no Jews left in Kiev. But they kept killing. And Babi Yar was the site of killing not only Jews, but also Slavic, uh, Roma, and other victims. Over the next two years, before the Red Army came to Kiev and liberated Kiev from Nazis in summer 1943, uh, many other people found their grave in Babi Yar. Red Army soldiers, sailors, partisans, uh, Roma, as I said, inmates of mental hospitals, and many, many others. Einsatzgruppen, in this, this mobile killing units that I mentioned earlier, were squads Com, uh, which consisted primarily of German SS and police personnel. Under the command of the German security police, their job was to uh, liberate the invaded territories from everyone who could potentially disagree with the Nazi politics and ideology. But what it really meant is that these were mobile killing units designed to kill the Jews. First, um, they started killing the Jews by shooting. That's how Jews were killed in Babi Yar. And that was going on, Babi Yar is most famous, but not the only shooting site. The Kamenets Podolsk, for example, is another very famous, uh, was the first shooting site. Also, there is a ravine, and of course, there's no, not even there's no monument, but also nobody knows uh, that the uh, Jews were killed there. So they were going on and killing people with those squads until the officers, part of those squads, started writing complaints to the German uh, uh, commanders saying it's too, taking too much toll on German officers. It's really hard to kill mentally. So in, 19, in late summer 1941, um, Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, uh, wrote a memo where he said it's too hard for Germans to kill. There's a psychological burden of mass shootings, plus too many bullets are wasted. So what they started, they requested the scientists to come up with a more efficient solution. And that efficient solution was found, and uh, what they did is that they uh, brought in mobile gas vans, mobile gas chambers. So the way they worked is there was a truck uh, filled with uh, mo uh, carbon monoxide. People were loaded on that truck, they would push the button, everyone in the truck would die, People who were in the truck would be dumped somewhere, later they would bury them at night, and then a new portion of uh, uh, Jews were put into this mobile 
event. And that is how the majority of Jews were killed from, 1940, from summer 1941 until, uh, I would say, the end of 1942, and then the Red Army started going back, and uh, the, uh, van, the, the killing was, uh, well, the killing of Jews was essentially completed by then. So, um, during the mass, the invasion of uh, the Soviet Union, the Einsatzgruppen with those mobile killing vans were uh, following the German army as it was invading the Soviet territory. Of course, they couldn't do all their work alone. They relied quite significantly on the help of the local population. This is not to say that all the local people who lived in Ukraine and Belarus were helping the Einsatzgruppen. All I'm saying is without the local support, at least of some local support, the mass killings on those mobile vans would not have been possible, just physically not possible, because they were killing hundreds and hundreds of people a day. Um, also, in contrast to what was going on in Romania, the Romania occupied Soviet Union, I'll talk about this in a second, and in Poland, Jews, usually Soviet Jews, were not um, deported anywhere. Uh, there were no killing centers where they would be killed. Instead, they were killed where they lived, locally. This is a huge difference between what was going on in Poland, for example, and also tells us quite a bit about Ukrainian-Jewish relations. There were four Einsatzgruppen, I think I have a map here. Um, one, each one of them had their own specific uh, ways of killing. They all killed with mobile vans, but some were more enthusiastic, let's say, than others. Um, Einsatzgruppe A started from East Prussia and went to Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Towards Leningrad, they stopped where the blockade was, and it massacred Jews of Kovno, Riga, and Vilna. You can just follow on the map. I don't have this magic red thing to show you, but you can find those places on the map. Einsatzgruppe B started from Warsaw in occupied Poland and then went through Belarus towards Smolensk and Minsk, massacring Jews in Grodno, Minsk, Brest-Litovsk, Slonim, Gomel, and Mogilov. The interesting thing about the Einsatzgruppe B is that we have a lot of reports saying that their, their biggest challenge was the gaining support of the local population. They complained about how they have to do everything by themselves. And yet, the, uh, the Jews were killed in, significant, in, in very significant numbers in those areas. The most cruel, or one of the most cruel Einsatzgruppen was Einsatzgruppe C which began its operation in Krakow, and then went across the western Ukraine towards Kharkov and Rostov-on-Don. Its personnel directed massacres in Lvov, Tarnopol, Zlochev, Kremenets, Kharkov, Zhitomir, and Kiev, uh, where, it, as uh, already mentioned, it famously killed 33,771 Jews in Babi Yar. This is by far the deadliest Einsatz group of all four. And then there's uh, Einsatz Group D, which went south, and they conducted the massacres in uh, Nikolaev, Kherson, Simferopol, Sevastopol, Feodosia, and Krasnodar region. Now, when I say Simferopol, Sevastopol, you recognize, of course, that this is the sites in Crimea, very much in the news today with all the new political developments uh, going on. Now Crimea is Russia. At that time, um, it, it was Ukraine. And uh, what's important about, uh, well, many things are important about Crimean massacres, but one of the important things is that uh, the uh, massacre near a city of Kerch called Bagerova became the first massacre site which journalists could see. So embedded journalists with the Red Army came and saw that, and this was the first report to the world press, Soviet or any other press, about the uh, massacre of such a scale conducted by the German army. For many reasons, some of which I'll discuss today, some of most of which I can't, the story about killing of Jews in Crimea did not become the worldwide sensation. Instead, it was shown as a, something killing civilians with Jews being down, as victims being downplayed quite a bit. Now, by spring 1943, Einsatzgruppen and other police battalions killed over one million of Soviet Jews and tens of thousands of Soviet political commissars, partisans, Roma, and institutionalized disabled people. 
Now, this lecture is called uh, uh, Story of uh, Memory is, a, in a, is in addition to history. So I want to just talk a little bit about this before we move on and talk about the other modes of death of, death of Jews in the Soviet Union. Um, Soviet army witnessed some of their events. Sometimes, uh, for example, um, you know, as soon as uh, Crimea is an interesting case because the Soviet army came to Crimea, tried to liberate it, and then they were left again, but they had enough time to see the, uh, the ravines. They had enough time to see the victims, and then the rumors spread all over the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union as the um, kind of immediately post-agrarian, but definitely pre-industrial society, the rumors played a huge role uh, in how the society operated. So uh, people knew that things were going on, and people knew that things were going on with Jews. Yet, the Soviet journalists, including the cinema journalists, those who filmed the Chronicles and then showed it in theaters, uh, showed Jewish victims, but almost never called them Jewish. Um, my colleague, Olga Gershenson, who suggested the film for uh, today, uh, and uh, who is, uh, is studying, actually, in detail, what uh, made it into the Soviet cinematic production about Holocaust as early as 1941, discovered tremendous stuff. For example, there was a film made in 1942 by Alexander Dovzhenko, a very famous Soviet uh, 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 director and producer, which filmed all the bones of people killed. And in fact, the film was uh, done in a, in a way that um, the bones, the, the skull, was talking to the audience and telling about the atrocities that happened to that skull. And uh, it was all shown. But once we started looking, she started looking to what exactly did they show. Turns out that the yellow stars or any other identifying markers on these bodies were not shown in these films. Imagine you show the massacres of tens of thousands of people and you, don't, you, you make sure that the corpses are turned in such a way that nobody can identify them as Jews. They talked about the killings, but not about killing as Jews. Why? Historians were asking this question for quite a long time. Why not say the Jews were killed? And one of the answers was that they used these um, documents in order to motivate Soviet soldiers to fight against Nazism. The Soviet soldiers would not be motivated as hard as if, if they knew that the civilians who were killed were Jews. Instead, they were told that these are your families, your mothers, your grandparents, your families, they're the ones being killed. Not naming them as Jews would serve as an important Soviet propaganda tool. Naming them as Jews would provoke the Soviet government feared quite a bit of anti-Semitism and if anything will decrease the motivation um, for the Soviet army to fight the Nazis. That was the beginning, the roots, of how the, Soviet, the Jewish victims were being portrayed in Soviet press. And a lot of things happened after the war was over, but that was the beginning. And what we heard with Professor Brenner said that you know, there is no monument that said the word Jew in Babi Yar. These are the roots of that. The, it actually, first, first monument that they, they did have the Jew, then they removed the Jew, then they put the Jew back. So there is this fighting, but it's a Jewish fight. The, um, uh, the, general, the general attitude is that if one calls the victims Jews, the, uh, the propaganda effect of that, um, uh, of, that mon of, of the Soviet war effort will be diminished. The second rule was uh, not to talk about Jews as victims, but rather talk about civilians as resistors. And that's another uh, thing that we heard earlier today. Uh, it was very important for the Soviet propaganda to say that civilians are being, not being killed just without resistance. Somebody is protecting them. Either they are fighting or the partisans are fighting for them. And it was very important to emphasize resistance. So if they said, well, somebody is killed, there's always a story about resistance. And, of course, the stories of local collaboration, Ukrainians helping, Belarusians helping, Russians helping, Tatars helping, those stories were taboo as well. Even if something like this happened, it was not allowed to say that a Soviet friendship of people will not survive the war. 
Now, as you can imagine, Soviet Jewish journalists, many of whom were embedded in the Soviet army, and many of who covered the war, they didn't want to agree with such portrayal of the, of the, of the Jewish victims of the war. Nobody knew it was going to be called Holocaust, of course. So um, many of them found creative ways to go around the system. And what's interesting about this story of memory and commemoration is that the story of how Jews were killed is a tragedy, as well as the story of how other Jews wanted to let others know about what happened. That story is also a story of resistance and also a story of uh, bravery that was required from these journalists to cover the Jewish death and, how they found, and, and, what, and what to say and what not to say. One of the first poems about Babi Yar was written by a famous Soviet journalist whose name is Ilya Ehrenborg. He was um, um, one of the most important, if not the most important, Soviet war correspondents. Before that, he was uh, uh, an author, uh, 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 a writer, and, um, and a community activist. Uh, his name was recognized across the Soviet Union. People who served uh, in the Soviet army uh, were telling me many times that uh, they're waiting for the Red Star newspaper to come out because that's where they'll see the Ehrenburg's article. Everyone knew his name. He was writing about uh, he was writing about Soviet war effort, about uh, uh, about different things, and they essentially uh, used as a motivational kind of uh, writer for the Soviet army. So it was a huge deal when in one newspaper, Ilya Ehrenborg published a poem which was called Babi Yar. I'm putting it on screen for you. It was written in Russian, but this is an English translation. Rachel Hyams and Leah's wonder, leper-like, half-alive, cast asunder, stones that the deaf and blind torment them. Old women wonder, shoeless, demented, roused by the night, young children wonder, dreams go them onward, Earth does not want them. Woe, an old wound is unsealed, and I suffer. Hannah was the name of my mother. A lot of things about this poem teach us about the bravery of Ilya Ehrenborg, who decided to write this, and also about how other writers learned how to cover the killing of Jews so it would make it into the Soviet press. Um, I want to point your attention to the fact that, except for the title of the poem, which was added, by the way, in 1960, we don't know where the place takes, uh, where the killings take place. There's no name of Babi Yar. The victims are also not named as Jews. Instead, what we see is their first names, Rachel, Chaim, and Leah. And uh, these are the biblical names. Soviet Jews were already, it was much more rare for them to have such Jewish sounding names in the 1940s, even if they were born with names like Sarah. In the words, the middle of the war, they were trying to change that name in order to make it less Jewish sounding. But here it's unapologetic coming back. But that's more or less on the surface, right? There is one thing about the, in this poem which hints to local collaboration, a complete taboo subject in the Soviet press. And if you look at the second line, where it says, leper-like, half alive, cast asunder. This thing, leper-like, means nobody wants to touch, nobody wants to defend. That is the hint to the locals who didn't help the Jews. They treated them as lepers. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, Jewish victims of, uh, mobile, of shootings of Babi Yar included, they were uh, buried in those ravines and there was no real, um, well, they were kind of covered by, by soil, but there was no real bar barrier. So because the ravines were shallow, a lot, what will happen is that after the rain, a lot of bodies will swim out and would, would show on the surface, and locals would see those bodies lying around the uh, sites of um, massacre. This is what this, the earth does not want them uh, lying, referring to. So already in 1944, Ehrenburg uh, bring, um, kind of alerts us to the fact that there are no monuments 
to those victims. And there is not only no monuments, but also no proper burial. And by the way, the majority of those people, the majority of those bones were not buried until, uh, well, so many are still not buried. My colleague Jeffrey Weidlinger went to the, um, uh, to, the to Ukraine uh, for the past 10 years and uh, to talk to the last Yiddish-speaking Jews there. And uh, some of the sites that people showed him is like, look, these are our bones. And the bones are just there in the forest uh, or in the field. And uh, uh, forget the memorials, just bones are there, no burial. And another enthusiast uh, uh, priest, Catholic priest, Patrick Dubois, went to Ukraine with the goal to bury those bones, but also to uncover what, um, uh, what happened to them. And finally, the, uh, there's a lot to say about this poem, but uh, what I wanted to uh, bring to your attention, the last line, and that is, Hannah was the name of my mother. That perhaps was the most daring thing that Ehrenberg did in this poem. Why? Because had he not brought, he made the story of Jewish killing personal. In other words, he, instead of aligning himself with the Soviet elites, with the leaders of the Soviet government, which he was, he decided to say that even though he's a communist and he is who he is, but Hannah is his mother's name. In other words, he preferred to ally himself with the Jewish victims as opposed to talking about Soviet soldiers liberating the Red Army. In other words, he chose the position of weakness to the position of military strength. Doesn't sound, if we don't know the context, doesn't sound like much, but after a poem like this was published, many others began to surface. And these were the rules which the Soviet writers who talked about uh, killings were following. Um, and it's not, it didn't work just for literature. It worked for, for art as well. If we see, I want to show you the uh, painting by Vitaly Avchinikov uh, uh, named Babi Yar, made in 1949. Um, on this uh, uh, painting, you see a woman crying and a, little, and a girl consoling her, and there are people walking in the window. And um, if we don't know that the painting is called Babi Yar, how would we know that, well, it's about Jews? And um, I was looking at this painting for a very long time, trying to understand what, what, what makes it Jewish? Like, there, you don't see the stars on the, on the sleeve. You don't see, I don't know, like, uh, uh, any, any identifying features of Jews, even like the Soviet uh, ways to deal with this, and something. And I was talking to my colleague, Professor Doris Bergen, a Holocaust historian, uh, about this, and I said to her, so, so how would you see it as a Holocaust painting? And she tells me, you know, the fact that there are civilians walking in the window, just because they're walking, and there are no soldiers, and there are no, and, it, and they have the bags, that is in itself as a symbol of people being sent to Babi Yar. And the truth is that if you learn to recognize the signs of the Holocaust message between lines, you learn to see a painting like this as a Jewish painting as a painting that depicts the Jewish victimhood during World War II and Jewish uh, suffering. In other words, nothing looks Jewish, but if it's understood by, as Jewish by the viewers, then it gains this additional double meaning. Now, the Soviet Union was not only, was uh, partially occupied by the Allied forces. Some of those, uh, uh, so, and uh, Einsatzgruppen were the most deadliest, but they were not the only ways to kill the Soviet Jews. Uh, a significant of Jewish, a number of Jewish victims and survivors, uh, fortunately, came from a region called Transnistria. Uh, which is the area occupied by the Allied forces, more specifically um, Romanian troops. So what happened there was that in September 1941, the Romanians began deporting Jews from Bukovina and Bessarabia districts 
to the region which they called Transnistria. Now, Transnistria is in a uh, kind of artificial name. Trans means beyond, and Nistria is Romanian name of the river uh, Dniester. So, uh, essentially, it means beyond the river Dniester. And uh, from all towns of that area, people were sent on foot to Transnistria with no exception, uh, the Jews. Uh, they had to walk, uh, they had to be carried, and uh, on that trip from all these areas of uh, Romanian-occupied um, Europe, 410,000 Jews died on the way just walking to the areas of Transnistria where the Romanians wanted them. Um, what happened with Jews in Transnistria during the war is still a very much open chapter of so history of Holocaust in the Soviet Union. In fact, more we know, more we know that we don't know. Uh, it's more uh, discussing Holocaust in Transnistria is even more difficult than uh, understanding how the Einsatzgruppen worked. Historians agree on almost nothing. Who was killed, who killed, why they killed, how was, was it possible to uh, avoid the death or, or was it not possible? Some of the deadliest killings of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union actually did, did take place in Transnistria uh, when 50,000 Jews were murdered in Odessa. Um, some of the more famous uh, concentration camps, and I already told you that there were no many concentration camps in, this Soviet, uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union during the war, but an important site of uh, uh, persecution of Jews was Pechora, uh, a, small, a concentration camp in Rogozina, which is a, a, a village in Vinitsa region, uh, which many survivors remember as death camp, and there are a few survivors from Pechora he living here in New York, and I met them with many of them about 10 years ago. Um, Historians, Western historians, refer to it as ghetto, and Soviet historians for very many years until, uh, I would say, 1990s, denied that the camp existed, which our site existed at all, and were hiding the archive until uh, it surfaced not so long ago. So once again, um, why is it so important to know? Because if we don't know, we can't commemorate and we can't give proper honor to victims in those places. One um, aspect of surviving the war in, in uh, Transnistria was that survivors are increasingly talking about few things. Number one is they talk about the fact that it was possible to bribe your way out or at least to ease your life. Uh, people who lived in the, uh, in the German-occupied Soviet Union could not, did not talk about that at all. Uh, the second thing that a lot of people are talking about is uh, the relationship between Jews deported to Transnistria from Romania and the local Soviet Jews were extremely difficult. In fact, uh, I noticed in my own interviews with uh, Holocaust survivors from Transnistria uh, here is that they're much more likely to complain about Romanian Jews than they were to complain about Romanians or even Germans. So there were very, very difficult uh, relationship there and that made it into the memory, uh, the Holocaust memory. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, or maybe fortunately, the only sources that we truly have about what happened to Transnistria, the very few testimonies of people who were willing to talk about that experience and uh, uh, told us about some of their perception of what was going on. Um, so I want to just tell you about one story of one uh, um, survivor, very briefly, and uh, yes, and there are many survivors of Pechora and Transnistria camps and, uh, and get us here in New York, but the one I'm going to use is, uh, uh, it was recorded from a woman named Svetlana, and she, lived in, uh, she lives in Toronto. She was born in Geisen in Ukraine, 1925, and um, uh, her story is typical in uh, in an unfortunate way that all her family members, including almost herself, were killed um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, during the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. And uh, what's unusual about her that she actually knew how they died. She uh, spent quite a bit of her life recording testimonies and asking, talking to locals and find, uh, finding out uh, about this. So she told me that um, uh, 
she herself was in Tulchin, another, um, let me see if I have the, no. Uh, it, it's another town in, uh, in East uh, Ukraine, uh, when the Germans arrived, and her whole family was in Geisen. So the Germans uh, um, entered, entered Geisen in uh, 1925 and immediately killed the mother's, uh, uh, her aunt, her mother's youngest sister, she was pregnant, and uh, they took the bayonet, bayonet, and they, they cut her belly and killed her that way. Her cousin, Grisha, Grisha Weisleb, an aspiring professional singer who miraculously escaped uh, the encirclements of the, of the, from the Red Army, was hiding in a bar. Uh, was burnt alive and uh, carried around the city, burned so that others could see. Her grandfather refused to come out when all the Jews were asked to come out of the house and go to the site of killing. So they killed Sarah's grandmother, uh, his wife, and made him carry her body to the site of shooting, which was um, located in the suburb of Geisen called Belendevka. Out of 10,000 Jews who lived in Geisen at this time, 8,000 were shot in those two days. But Sarah's grandfather was shot but wounded, not killed. And at night he came out, walked through the forest, and joined the partisans, where miraculously he was not given right back to the Germans. Now, this is an important part of uh, Soviet uh, s s history of the Holocaust. We always think of Jews going to partisans as a kind of way to save their lives. But the truth is it was very dangerous for partisans to give refuge to Jews because uh, Jews were targeted by Germans. So what they often did is that they would trade Jews uh, for their own captured by Germans. And that's what happened with most Jews who were able to escape those ravines and found their way to partisans. But it didn't happen to Sarah's grandfather, and the reason it didn't happen is that her, his um, cousin was in that partisan detachment, and he was very useful by trying to uh, provide food and giving them local information, so they kept the cousin and they kept the grandfather. The grandfather survived the war, but the cousin was killed just two weeks before the Red Army came to Geisen, and the reason he was killed is that one of the locals recognized him and uh, uh, gave him out to Germans. So of 10,000 Jews who lived in Geisen in 1941, only 20 people survived. Sarah herself did not survive the war because she was not in Geisen when the war began. She was in Tulchin. Tulchin is another town in southeast Ukraine. And um, she experienced quite a bit of running around. She, um, first the German, uh, first uh, the army came and they, uh, they wanted her to go and help to clean their motorbikes. And she went to clean the motorbike and then, uh, and then she went home and she said, I don't want to clean the motorbike. And then the, uh, they found her and they wanted, and she remembers that she was being led to this uh, ditch to be shot. And then uh, somebody called, is there somebody here know how to mend socks? And she said, yes, I know how to mend socks. So eight girls from that uh, row were saved, and she was one of them. And, those, uh, and she didn't even know how to mend socks. She just quick, uh, thought quickly on her feet. And um, uh, after all that, um, she, um, she ended up in Pechora camp, uh, where they sent everyone who uh, everyone uh, in her in in uh, Tulchin who could walk, and Pechora camp was located. This is a picture of it from today. It was located in the former tuberculosis sanatorium, and in a very beautiful part of uh, um, uh, town, as you can see. And one side of it was the river, and um, that allowed a lot of people to escape. And that's how we have some survivors from Pechora. What's unusual about Pechora is uh, a few things. Number one, a lot of survivors say when they entered the Pechora site, there was a, a big uh, sign there saying uh, Lager Smerti, which means death camp. And some survivors remember the sign, others don't remember the sign, and historians don't know who to believe. And um, uh, historians don't even all say that it was actually a true camp, because uh, some characteristics of a camp suggest that it was actually a ghetto. But, uh, an important feature that everyone agrees on is that there was no food there, so they did not feed the inmates. And that's how they dealt with the, uh, with the narrow uh, accommodation situation. So people had nowhere to sleep, they would die, and then more people will come and they would die. So how would they survive? Um, 
kids, young kids, were able to go through the uh, narrow gate, and I'll show you in a second, uh, through those, uh, and the narrow gate would give us to those steps, there were 97 steps. They had one old kettle, Sarah told me about the kettle, and she's not the only one who talked about the kettle. And they would go to the river on those steps and carry some water and boil the poison ivy in that water, and that's what they ate. So people who managed, who could survive that, survived the camp, and this is how, and only uh, young people who were strong could do those steps and who were, uh, were able to survive. And it's also a very important story, which I don't have time to just, uh, talk about today, is that who decides who survives and who gets that poison ivy soup and who doesn't. Um, when Sarah, uh, eventually she escaped the camp, uh, she joined the partisans. Uh, it's, uh, the history is silent on how she survived there, but from what I understood, one of the officers or at least partisan leaders uh, took her under his patronage. She was 15 years older than her. Uh, they lived together uh, and um, he told her two important things. Number one, you survived the war in evacuation and you've never heard of Pechora. And number two, your name is not Sarah, but Svetlana. You, we don't have your documents, so this is what it's going to be like. So when the war was over, she was not allowed, she didn't talk about anything that happened to her or to her family. She just, her way of dealing with this was to go around and ask what happened to my mother, what happened to my father, and she knew unusually in much detail what happened to each of them. But then she wanted to go study. She eventually became a dentist, and that's what she, she did all her life um, before the immigration to, to Israel and then to Canada. Um, so she had to go enter the medical school, uh, the dental school, and for that she needed to write a composition, an essay. And uh, she didn't really go to school because she was very young and there was all this camp and then she didn't really know how to write properly. And uh, she decided that in order, uh, she can't lie where she was, and she's going to write that composition. And she wrote exactly what happened to her in Pechora in her entrance uh, composition. The examiners thought that she had the most wild imagination a child can have and admitted her into the institute without asking extra questions, without uh, doing this. And that's how she, uh, she finished the institute and became a dentist. Now, after the war was over, uh, the Soviet army came and somebody asked her, her, like, look at the building, what is this building? And she says, that's Pechora Dafkin. So how do you know it's Pechora Dafkin? So well, yes, this is what it was. So she was able uh, actually not to listen to her boyfriend at that time and identify a few people, locals who collaborated and, uh, um, and sh show who they were. But after that, she realized it was too dangerous because many people who were older than her and who pointed out that this was a death camp were actually arrested and sent to Soviet prisons. Why? Because it was said that if they survived the war as Jews under Romanian occupation, it means they, were, they themselves had been collaborators. And that made them enemies of the Soviet regime. So it was very, very dangerous for survivors to actually talk about that experience. But as anyone who experienced trauma knows, it's impossible to hold it all inside. People have to know. So Sarah found a way to deal with this, um, uh, to deal with the need to somehow talk about that experience. Um, one way, uh, what happened was that her husband's uh, brother came back from the war. He was an artist. He came back from the war with one arm and no legs. Um, and uh, he was about to commit suicide and didn't know what to do with himself. And Sarah said to him, you know, nobody's going to hire you to do anything. You can live with us, and I'm going to tell you what to paint. I'm going to tell you what happened to me in Pechora, and you're going to paint those paintings. And that's what they did for 10 years, from 1955 till 1965. She tried to remember everything that happened, and he painted those, he made those paintings. Today, uh, through a lot of difficulty, she brought those paintings to uh, Israel and then to Canada, and then now they will be displayed very soon in the Ottawa uh, Museum of Art. Beautiful, beautiful art. Um, important not only artistically, but also but important because they 
it, the paintings signify the bravery and the memory and the process of how the um, surviving the war in the Soviet Union was documented by Jews. And this is, um, and this is something that I would like to finish with, and this is to say that um, the story of how people did not forget or preserve the memory of what happened to Jews in the Holocaust, in the Soviet Union, deserves its very special commemoration. Here in New York, many years ago, I met a man, Yuri, uh, in Brooklyn, who uh, lived in this uh, Section 8 apartment, I don't know if you know, but it's a very small apartment in Brooklyn where many Russian uh, immigrants live. And um, so it was a, it was a two bedroom place, uh, a one bedroom place, and the bedroom was filled with papers, like really, like you go in and you trip and his wife kept apologizing. So I asked him, so what are all these papers? I, I sympathize, my desk also, you know. So, um, and, uh, and she says, uh, and he sa she says, that, oh, he'll tell you. And what he told me is this, that he was working as an engineer in Romanov, which is Dnieper uh now, and he spent all his life, starting from 1951 up until he immigrated to America in 1989, collecting stories about what happened to each family in Romanov during the Holocaust. Who betrayed who, how they died. Some people were killed for the wells. They would just pile the bodies in the wells and put some poison in it and close the lid. Some people were burned in, um, in bathhouses and in synagogues. He knew what happened to every one of 3,000 people of Romanov. He spent all his life doing this. Did he seek for any recognition? Did he seek for any, uh, you know, like I uh, didn't have a historic ambition? No, he was an engineer. But he said it was his duty to make sure that we know what happened to Jews in Romanov. This work was extremely dangerous because just saying that Jewish victims were Jewish victims and not Soviet victims, that alone was quite dangerous. But he did what he did. He brought all these documents to America. I think he was planning to donate them to YIVO, but at the end of the day, donated them to uh, United States Holocaust Museum. Another person, a medical doctor, also here from New York, who spent, uh, um, uh, who spent all his life talking to patients um, and recording, once again, what happened in the city where he was from. He wrote poems with this information, because he believed that poetry is a way to pass on the message. The Holocaust in the Soviet Union, or experience of Jews in the Soviet Union during the war, is unusual, not only because it's not commemorated or remembered. Um, it's unusual also because uh, 500,000 of Soviet Jews served in the Soviet army during the war, 140,000 of them were killed. Um, about 1.1 million of Soviet Jews survived the war in the Soviet rear, uh, and about 250 to 300,000 of Polish Jews also survived the war in Soviet rear, and that is Soviet Central Asia and Siberia. Um, and, of course, about 2.8 million of Soviet Jews were killed as civilians during the Holocaust. It is with the, and by the way, none of those facts belong to the mainstream of Soviet or post-Soviet commemoration of, of the Holocaust. And also, unfortunately, until very recently, did not belong to the Western Holocaust education programs. I don't know what it's like in the, in the States here and in New York, but in Toronto, a group of enthusiasts spent a long, long time trying to fight that the story of Soviet Jews being killed during the Holocaust enters in the Jewish day school curriculum. Uh, it's, it's been a huge fight to say that not all Jews died in Auschwitz and there were also Jews killed in the Soviet Union, but the process is very, very slow. Um, Conducting research, looking for documents, uh, was, is a very, very difficult um, job, a very brave job, and a lot of people have done it. So in fact, um, just before I came here to give a talk at YIVO, I got a phone call uh, from um, uh, a friend of a man who sits right here, Professor Levit, uh, who is here in the front row, just I haven't met him yet. But, um, uh, who, who spent a, a lot of uh, his time and life and uh, uh, academic effort to, to record 
of uh, to record uh, the murder of Jews in Transnistria, and he brought the map here to show me, which I haven't seen, the map which he produced by his own effort without institutional support. In other words, the enthusiasm uh, enthusiasm with which and the dedication which people had uh, to record of what happened has to be honored and it has to be understood. And it is our task, I believe, to ensure that we have to tell the story until it's too late when we, like the youngest son from the Passover Seder, just finished, all reach the state of not knowing what to ask. Thank you. I would like uh, to add one small thing and to commend uh, Professor Stentris on her uh, presentation, which was excellent. But there is one factor that I think does need to be made uh, public uh, about the absence of commemoration of Jew Jewish victims in the Soviet Union. On the one hand, during the war, it was quite true to call attention to the Jews would perhaps uh, diminish the Soviet war effort. But after the war, with the creation of the State of Israel and the onset of the doctor's plot and the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, uh, Jews were targeted as enemies of the Soviet state. And to call them victims or heroes was completely unacceptable by Stalin. And uh, so there is this other side to the story that uh, is also worthy of some attention. I simply wanted to make no, that of comment. Course, of course. Yes. Thank you. 40 minutes, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take some questions from the audience for Professor Sternstein. Um, I have, to, uh, I happen to know a, a little more about. Uh, uh, the state, the, the fate of Jews in Romania on the map that you showed us. Uh, and so I have to make a little bit of correction. Yeah, you see Transnistria, it's, it's a, just as wide, maybe wider than Bessarabia itself. Right. In reality, Transnistria is a, a lot, a lot smaller. Right. Um, number two, uh, some numbers that you used, 400,000 Jews, Transnistria actually, and you were, you were saying that Transnistria is not very, uh, not very documented, who killed who, who was, uh, well, in Romania it's very well documented. I was, sorry, thank you. I was talking about the Soviet part of it, okay. the Odessa and the Kishinev and all that area. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So, in Romania, it, it, so the, the, the guy who perpetrated the ruler of Romania, Ion Antonescu, was clearly... <laughs> Uh, responsible for half of the Romanian Jewish population. Uh, and uh, his interest was at the end, uh, at the beginning of uh, 1943, uh, the, with a disaster in Stalingrad, to, to get out of the war uh, and to improve the, the Jewish condition. So that's why he, uh, he did not volunteer to send uh, the re remaining of Romanian Jews to, the, to their concentration camps. Thank you. Thank you. A few more questions. For many years, the number six million was used right. as the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. What is the total number of Jews killed in the Holocaust if we add the number of Jews in the Soviet Union that were killed in the Holocaust. That number, six million, includes the Jews killed in the Soviet Union. Yes. So what we know less about is, uh, while she walks, I will answer your question in more detail. What we know less about is that about three million Jews were killed in Poland that we know, but we kind of don't know where they are. It's less of a public knowledge where the other three million comes from. And the majority of them were killed in the Soviet Union. That's, that's one of the points that I was trying to make. There's some relativity involved here. At a certain point in Hungary, if you could cross the border to Romania, your life was saved. Uh, situation in Serbia. Serbia's a good place to be if you can get there. Uh, 
Bulgaria is half and half. If you're a Bulgarian, you'll be saved. If you're an immigrant in, you could end up in bad shape. And Romania, as you said, half the time it's really right. bad, and half the time it's not so bad. So it's it's a crazy world out there. Huh? Absolutely. You know, it's very it's funny sometimes how I say uh, I, I say to give a talk about Holocaust in the Soviet Union. Of course, I get all the questions outside of the Soviet Union, um, which makes me uncomfortable. But <laughs> but thank you. I wanted to, as Elena goes to ask another question. I mentioned that map that Professor Levit made. He brought it here, so I wanted to show you. Well. Uh, Not the, not the PowerPoint thing, but this is the map that he produced himself, which has uh, the uh, names of the places where there were ghettos and uh, sites of killings of Jews in Transnistria. So you see some of them are red, and some of this. I, I, it's the first time I see the map, but I thought it would be wonderful to use this opportunity to show how much work and how much dedication <coughs> it took to create a map like this and how valuable I would like to say that I would title a little bit differently your book uh, <laughs> because you are talking about the Holocaust on the territory of Soviet Union. Soviet Union has its own terrible history of genocide of all the people, including the Jews. So this was still done by the German, by the Nazi. Right. Yeah. We're gonna take a f just a few more questions. Okay. Thank you. you. You're waiting for questions, sorry? Yes. But by the way, absolutely marvelous lecture. I, I came you. to this country as refugee 37 years ago. I never couldn't find where I can put my grandmother who was thrown away from the hospital in Kharkov from the third floor by Ukrainian nationalist. And what about my father, captain of the Soviet army, who was also Jew, was killed near Warsaw. So I really uh, give Eva and you particularly just great appreciation. I put these people in the uh, Yad Vashem, but before your lecture, I didn't know where to put this. I right. just want a little bit extend you. You should go, not just Brooklyn, but maybe in New Jersey where I live. So I can... <laughs> So I can tell you, so how you, calcul you calculate three million Jews, and of course, one of them is my relative. What I tell you, so all together, Soviet Union lost 28 million people. Correct. From about 16 million civilian, 12 million Soviet soldier. Right. It was nobody paid attention, but that Red Army, they also, only Jew in Red Army fought actually against Nazi. Now, two million, what I, what I really object in your presentation and any comment in Eva, which I used to be proud member for 20 years, it's a too politicized. You still under this cold war objection. Do you know so the two million two million Soviet Jew who was or, or Polish who was saved was saved on direct order of Stalin. I hate this man, I won't kill him when I was young, but he gave order when a German Well Stalin actually I will pay you a hundred bucks if you huh? show me that order. That's been, uh, right, that's, that's um, you know. Um, Excuse me, another. No, I'm just saying that historians are looking for that order for Stal of Stalin Come to save on. Jews. I was Doesn't saving my family because my father, officer, Stalin gave order in a train. I took this train. Right. Stalin gave order. First military factory, okay, second family of Soviet officer, Correct. communist and Jew. Sure. This is why. Half Correct. of my family survived. Please don't politicize in the memory of these people. Stop this communist. Do you know communist party have before Second World War? 15 million people. Almost half of them were Jewish. People who stay in Babel Yar, they were the communists. Some people who blow Hrishatik, they were Jewish communists. You know who killed Petlura, by the way? I'm sorry, Bandera. First massacre was done in Lvov before German start. And he killed. He, he killed Soviet, communist, Jew, Polish, and after start for joy. Who mentioned it? Now his portrait Bendera on the key, by the way, Crimea, Crimea. I got your you point. Go? I got your point. Thank you, sir. I got your point. Absolutely. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to end with one last question. Okay. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I apologize for the previous remarks. Uh, Don't apologize. So, uh, uh, just like... Uh, uh, just like there are deniers of global climate change, there are deniers of local collaboration that you right. mentioned. I encountered it personally. I sent a letter to my uh, son's music teacher uh, about uh, this uh, issue, and her response was that mm, I have a wild imagination. But historical evidence seems pretty strong. What would you respond, not that I don't believe, what would you respond to deniers of local collaboration? Right. Well, you know, okay, just don't throw things at me, okay? Just, just yell. <laughs> the voice, you know, as I tell my kids, indoor voice. Um, so the, there's no subject more controversial than local collaboration and the more difficult to study. Um, and uh, to be honest, uh, in, the Soviet, in the Soviet climate, um, talking about local collaboration was not allowed. Even when Vasily Grossman and Leah Ehrenberg were conduct, uh, compiling material for the Black Book, which is the uh, testimonies of atrocities, uh, one of the directions that they were given was to downplay the collaboration. And in fact, only uh, recently we published the unknown black book in English where they had some of the stories of collaboration. But in other words, this is a very taboo topic. In the West, the opposite was true. In the West, the story goes, Ukrainians killed the Jews just like the Germans killed the Jews. And that's kind of, that goes, goes with this story. Holocaust survivors that I spoke to, and uh, you know, not only I spoke to them generally, are uh, upset with this, um, usually with this uh, assertion because, uh, you know, definition of the word collaboration is a very difficult one. Um, what counts as collaboration? A lot of, a, a very prominent Holocaust survivor in uh, Toronto from Kovno, Ellie Gotts, uh, you know, he and I just had coffee and he says to me, what is this talk about Lithuanians collaborating? So Jews collaborated, Lithuanians collaborated. Where do you draw the line? How can you, you know, like how do you define evil and where do you go with this definition? So it's not, there's no easy answer to this. Some scholars um, or some enthusiasts, like the one I already mentioned, Patrick Dubois, the Catholic priest, he had this whole idea that he'll go to Ukraine and he'll talk to Ukrainians and he'll ask them what happened because believe it or not, that work has not really been done taking the point of view of non-Jews, seeing what they remember and how it all happened. So he recorded quite a bit uh, of testimonies of what people were doing. And now we have a much more nuanced understanding of collaboration in general. So before that, we would have collaborate and resist But now there's a category of bystander. There's also a category of uh, a witness. Uh, so there is also, how do you call a girl who makes uh, food for... Um, the German soldiers, afraid of being killed, but then those Germans go and kill the Jews. Is she a collaborator? I mean, this is, this is very, very difficult questions, and that's why historical research in that area is very important. And unfortunately, um, the materials, the archival documents, and people who remember are very scarce, and it's very hard to identify. But I thank you for that question, because your question actually answers this everlasting uh, prompt, how long can you still study Holocaust? Isn't there all we already know? There's a lot we don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>